Hello my loves, Tony here from Teal Yarn Crafts and welcome back to my channel. This is my first official video of 2023 and I'm pretty excited to get back into the studio. I'm just kind of waking up out of that haze of the holidays. My tree is still up. Me and my husband have decided we are not taking it down till Martin Luther King Day because it is just so stinking pretty. But when it comes to transitioning back into work, I don't know if anybody else is like this, but I get this kind of post-holiday haze where it's like I'm in my office and I'm checking the emails and I'm signing the books, but like I'm not all the way there. It just takes takes me some time to warm back up into the work day, especially after taking like two weeks off. Two much needed weeks off that I don't regret for anything. Now let's address the big pink elephant in the room. We made it to 500K the evening of December 30th. So it didn't even take all the way to the new year for us to get to our goal. So the 500K celebration is gonna happen a little bit later in the podcast, but I did wanna put a big thank you right here in the front. I wasn't exactly sure how this was gonna go. I'm a goals oriented person. So I always like to put goals and metrics on the things that are important to me and reaching this milestone was a big deal. Sure the numbers don't matter so much but it does indicate some growth and some interest in what I do here on my channel. So I want to thank every single person that's watching whether you're subscribed or not thank you for just spending a little bit of time with me. Now I am a person who does believe that there is balance in the world so for every high there does have to be a low and there was a low for us over the holiday season. My family lost somebody that was very very important to us so we spent a good bit of the holiday break honoring her memory. So I want to take a moment to recognize Miss Earlene Argent and send my condolences to her family. It was a massive loss, but as somebody who loved the Lord and loved her family, it seemed apropos that she went home to be with her Lord and Savior on his birthday. It was also an opportunity for the family to get together, mourn together, but also see each other. I met a lot of people from my husband's side of the family that I've never met before, and I feel like I have a whole other family now. So big love to Erlene. She always had a kind word and a smile on her face. And if you met her, she would tell you how much she loved the Lord, and that just... It made my heart sing every time I got to spend time with her. It's about time to start this episode, but first let's give some love to our cup of caffeine sponsor. Today I am drinking out of my sticker mug, which is available in the merch section of my shop. Absolutely love it. It's got my little cat peanut butter and my little girl Sheba on it. So it's literally my favorite mug to drink out of. So today's cup of caffeine sponsor is Liz. And when donating, Liz said, I've been watching you for a while, but your year in review video was really inspiring for me. As a tall person, who also has a body shaped like yours, seeing the sweaters you made fit so well was inspiring. Thank you. Your art is so beautiful and I'm so glad you share it with the world. Well, thank you so much, Liz. Doing that video was really inspiring to me as well, kind of seeing the culmination of everything that I've created, including multiple sweaters, was kind of a big milestone for me too. So I hope that's something that you'll dive into this year because honestly, and I don't say this lightly, but making your own sweater is life-changing. Now, if you enjoy my videos and want to support my channel, buy me a coffee. Who knows? I might shout you out in my next video. Now, let's talk current ways. So since we were going through kind of a mourning process over the holidays, you betcha booty that I started a brand new blanket. I've mentioned it here before, but blankets are kind of my comfort project. It's something that I can spend a lot of time in, but make it relatively quickly, and I just need something to relax and turn my brain off. And that blanket project is right here. Ooh, she's a doozy. Whew. So I went to Joanne and I picked up a whole bunch of Hue and Me from Lion Brand. So Hue and Me is a category five bulky weight blend of wool and acrylic. I really like this yarn for blankets because it's so incredibly off. It's also machine washable and the palette is fantastic. The yarn was designed by Alexi of Two of Wands who is one of my absolute favorite people and I'm not surprised that she came out with a yarn that I am obsessed with. So what I've got going here are linen stitch squares. You might remember that I did linen stitch squares for my 2021 temperature blanket which is a fan favorite and also honestly my favorite temperature blanket that I've ever made. Those linen stitch squares are so fun. They work up really fast and I just love the linen stitch because it's beginner friendly but it also gives you this density while still being flexible. So what I did is took one of my six main colors and created the square and then I'm putting a border of this color called salt around each one. I'll then seam them all together but instead of seaming them in just regular blocks like this I'm going to rotate them and kind of put them on the bias. So just imagine kind of this patchwork of all of these squares that are turned on their sides. From there I'm going to fill in the sides with triangles which I've made those as well so the triangles will fit 
Is this the front or the back? That's the front, okay. The triangles will fit just like this, just like this to give us a nice even side. So all of my squares and triangles are complete. I'm just going to put it all together. I still need to figure out the design for the very corners of the blanket, but I might just leave those off and kind of give it this soft, almost oblong shape. From there, I'll put a border on it and I am going to make a matching pillow and eventually this will become a kit from Lion Brand. What started out as just kind of a comfort, relaxing project is transitioning into something I can use for my business and it's just another reason why I absolutely love being a full-time crocheter. <laughs> so that is just one of many whips that I have going on right now. Another project that I started over the holiday is a scrappy granny cardigan. Now one of the fun concepts that I came across in one of my many Pinterest searches is a granny square cardigan that is created from a couple of hexagons. You essentially start making the hexagons and you go round and round and round and then you fold them up in this really simple but somehow intricate way and it becomes a cardigan. Now I've never made one before. I've seen them everywhere. One of my favorite designers, Jess from Make and Do Crew, made this gorgeous cardigan out of that design. And I thought it would be fun for me to wake one as well. I also have a ton of leftover yarn scraps from my Rhinebeck sweater. I thought that would be a great use for them. So let me show you what I've got so far. So this is the hexagon and you can see it kind of folds in on itself, but the way that it folds in is actually useful because you bring these corners together and you can see we have the start of a cardigan. Now clearly I haven't gotten too far yet but that's the joy of a project like this because I'm literally just going into the bag grabbing something and putting it on this project. So what I'm doing is using fingering weight yarn held double and I am turning my rounds each round. I don't have a color scheme in mind. I'm using my leftovers for my Rhinebeck sweater and I actually went through my mini skein drawer and pulled out a whole bunch of other mini sets that I had lying around. This year is going to be my year to work down my stash. I have a couple different ways that I'm planning to do that whether that's putting yarn into projects gifting yarn or selling it. But I have a lot of interest in exploring other crafts this year. This is my year of experimentation. So I need to make some space for the other things that I wanna get into. And that's gonna involve getting rid of at least a bit of the yarn that I have. So this is gonna be a great project for that because since I am a healthy size girl, I'm gonna be using plenty of yarn here. And depending on how much I love it, once I'm done with this part, I might extend the bottom a bit. And I'm also of course gonna to have to extend the arms. Now Jess's version from Making Do Crew had a hood and I don't have any handmade projects with a hood on them. So I might borrow that idea and put that on here as well. Now, of course, since this isn't an original design, I'm not going to make it a paid pattern, but I will likely document this process and put it up on my blog. So if you're interested in this project, make sure you're subscribed to my newsletter because once this is done and the blog post is up, I will announce it there and you can check it out. And the last project in my pile is this stack of soap sacks. So very short story, but I met a delightful woman named Stacy at the Pittsburgh Creative Arts Festival over the summer. Now Stacy runs a nonprofit organization called SAC, which encourages volunteer makers to either crochet, knit, loom, whatever, soap sacks that can then be gifted to various charities. Now those charities can be anything from food pantries to homeless shelters, LGBT organizations, veteran organizations, anybody who might need soap for the people that they service. Now it's really fun because this is a great way to use up leftover cotton and you're also donating to worthy causes. So my mom actually used a bunch of cotton that was from my stash to make a stack of soap sacks. And I promised Stacy that I would make a Tunisian crochet pattern that she could offer to others to create soap sacks as well. So that is my project for this coming weekend. I'm very excited to make as many soap sacks as possible. And then I'm just gonna run over to Sam's Club and get a big box of bar soap. Crocheting for charity is something I like to sprinkle in throughout the year. I often have like leftover samples of hats and scarves that I can donate to organizations. I'm really excited to get more involved with SAC this year because I love the way that Stacey has made it very easy for someone with a low amount of time but a high amount of interest in crafting to be part of this worthy cause. So I'm going to include a link down in the description for you to learn more about SAC. If you happen to have a bunch of leftover cotton in your stash, here's a great way to get rid of it. This is also a fun way for church groups or sip and stitches to do something fun together. So there's going to be a link down in the description for you to get more involved with SAC and thank you so much to Stacey for bringing this organization into my life. Now let's talk recently finished projects and I have to start this off with my 2022 temperature blanket because it is officially done. And by officially done, it means all I have left to do is lightly block it and also snip off the rest of the ends. I've weaved in all of the ends, but I still need to go through and snip them all off. I'm going to give you as best of a visual of it because this thing is huge. So since you last saw this blanket, I have been able to add the border and I did try it out on my queen size bed, which it fits perfectly. Oh my gosh, it fits so perfectly. 
All right, so here she is. Oof. Okay, this is pointless. Okay, <laughs> can you see it? Not really. Okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Let me see if that helps. Okay, here she is for the most part, but I'll include some additional photos so you can kind of see what it really, really looks like. But what I want you to see more so is this border. So the way that this blanket worked out is I got through December 27th of making actual blocks. So there were still five days left. So for the first of those days, I did one round of our linen stitch to create a nice border around the blanket. And then for the remaining four days, I continued on with that linen stitch stitch in the border but I did one day on each side and then for the very last round I just pulled that first color of the border and put it on the outside again just to give it a nice frame. So here's a quick peek at the corner so you can see how lovely these colors worked up in the border. I kept the border very very simple because after a year of working on a blanket do you really want to spend like another week on the border? Absolutely not. Like I said I did try it out on my queen size bed which is the whole point of making this blanket was to put it on the queen size bed in my guest room and it does fit perfectly. So I'm really excited to eventually pull some of the colors out of this blanket and decorate that room. I'm going to officially finish it up, snip off the rest of the ends, do a little quick steam block and then I'm going to put it on the bed. Then I need to take all of my notes and tips because I have a lot when working on a blanket this size, put them into a blog post and that is going to be available on Friday, January 13th. I'm also partnering up with Bonnie of Green Letter Day to help you get your hands on the colors and exact yarn that I use in this blanket. So make sure you're on my email list so you can find out about that as soon as that information is available. So of course, since I finished my 2022 blanket, I have to transition into 2023. And I'm so glad you're here because I can finally open these boxes. So this is one of two giant boxes that I've had sitting in my office for well over a week. I wanted to wait until we got together so I could open them with you. I have partnered with Ashley of Sorella for my 2023 temperature blanket and oh my gosh I can't even get it out because I'm like I mean I can barely get this out because I, it feels like Christmas morning again having these right here but let me kind of walk you through this from the very beginning. So back in October I reached out to Ashley and said hey do you want to partner on a temperature blanket? She's like absolutely I thought she'd never ask and we got to talking about the inspiration. So I wanted to go with Morocco meets boho. So let's get this visual going right? You're walking through a Moroccan spice market. It, everything smells good. It looks good. You get samples of things. Everything tastes good. I wanted to have that experience in my temperature blanket, but also with a boho style to it, bringing that saturation down a little bit, but still letting that color pop. And I knew Ashley would be able to take that really weird description and turn it into something gorgeous. So now we can finally get these open. So we've got pull tabs here. Oh, my grip strength is terrible. Ugh. So just remember, this is one of two boxes. Isn't her packaging just, seriously? Okay, and then we get this side open. Oh my gosh. So this is like a soft pink. This is a soft blue. I got four skeins of everything for a couple reasons. When I talk through the design, you'll understand. Grayish going on here. And then what's this? This is like a dusty brownish brick red. Fantastic. Like, can you, can you see where I was going? Where it's like, you take those really nice range of colors and just throw a little bit of boho dust over the whole thing. So it just kind of softens everything up. We went with a fingering weight this time around because I have a really fun design idea, which we'll go through in just a second. We do have a couple blues. I'm bringing some blues and some greens back into the palette because I'm starting to just understand them a little bit better. Now, of course, it's not gonna be a TL Yarncraft palette without some mustard in it. So we've got that mustard yellow in there. And of course it won't be a TL Yarncast palette without some grapefruit in there. Like these, these are my colors. These scream Tony. So they had to go in there. Now this, this is the thing that, um, let me, let me, let me reset real quick. Hold on. What's inside of here is likely going to blow your mind. Now, if you recall from a couple videos ago, I was talking about how difficult it is to find metal Tunisian crochet hooks. And somehow, through her own magic, Ashley has found a way to make that happen for us. Let's open this up. Okay, I have to see it first and then you can see it. <laughs> Do you see this? Look at this. Look. Look at these. They are gold, interchangeable Tunisian crochet hooks. And the hook heads are literally just like my favorite 
crochet hooks. So within this pack, I'm getting three and a half millimeter up to eight millimeter. Looks like I've got these gorgeous clear cords as well as stoppers and extenders and keys. So let me attach one really, really quick. They feel so good. Oh, they've got like this nice kind of matte finish on them. Let me see if I can. So you see, it's got a shine to it, but it has this matte finish. And it also has a thumb rest, like literally all the things that I've been looking for in a Tunisian crochet hook. They're nice and they're hard, like they're not soft, it's not bendy, and it's a nice length too. Like it's fitting in my hand just fine. The cords feel nice. These definitely feel like the kind where if you wanna straighten them out, you just dip them in a little hot water for a second. These cords do require a key, which is not typically my favorite way to use a cord, but you know what, I'll take it. I am not gonna complain. <laughs> I am not gonna complain. And they're not swivel cords, which is okay, but I mean, with cords like these, I'm sure I'd have a swivel cord that would fit into this hook. All things considered, we are well on our way to my ideal set of Tunisian crochet hooks. This hook set has been a long time coming, at least in my head. It's something that I've been wanting for a very, very long time. And the fact that Ashley was able to bring it to life just makes my heart sing. I didn't have to do all the hard work, but I get to reap all of the benefits. <laughs> So I am in conversation with Ashley right now to see how we can get these hooks from my hands into yours. Hey lovely, so I'm currently editing the podcast episode and I was able to talk to Ashley while I was kind of working through all of this. And she said they recently got in their big shipment of these Tunisian crochet hooks and she's going to make them available this week. I don't know the exact day, I don't know the exact time, so make sure you're following Sorella Yarn on Instagram or signed up for their newsletter for details on when these hooks will be available. But we do have one more box to open. So let's take a look at the rest of the palette. Oh man. Ugh. Oh, look at this. Look at that brownish, greenish beautifulness. And then we have like a deeper kind of sandy green, more of that gorgeous dusty brick red, and then also kind of a rosier, lighter red. We've got this beautiful kind of clay color, as well as like a deeper green clay. Mm. There are a few purples in here because blues, greens, purples, not colors that I typically use, but the more I see them, the more I love them. I think when they're part of a larger gorgeous palette, I get why people are so interested in purple. Like I get it, I get it now. And then last but not least, this really gorgeous, this kind of rosy violet color and then the rest of this purple. So I'll add a photo here of the final palette. I am really, really pleased with it. I think Ashley and the team outdid themselves and I am so grateful for their diligence in making this come to life for me. So let's talk a little bit about the design. Like I mentioned in my last video, I'm going for a Tunisian crochet chevron and to make the temperature blanket idea a little bit more approachable, instead of doing one row for every single day, I'm doing the forward pass in one day and the return pass in the following day. So with that kind of design, I'm going to end up with something that's more of a throw size instead of a full queen size. Now typically with a temperature blanket, you're tracking the current weather. So like for the year 2023. Now I wanted to try something a little bit different. With a temperature blanket, you're typically tracking the current weather. So for the year of 2023. But I wanted to do something that was a little bit more sentimental. So I'm going with the first year that I got married, which was 2010. And I'm going to use the historic weather for where we were living when we got married, which is Columbus, Ohio. I really like this idea because then I'm not bound by the current months of having to wait for the dates to come out. I can work on this project more leisurely and the idea is to get it done by the middle of the year. So I'll be working on it from January all the way through late June. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Tony, you just showed us a whole bunch of yarn for a throw size blanket. I know, believe me, I've thought this through. I had two ideas for designs that I wanted to do in 2023 and I found a way to make both work. So after I finish this first Tunisian crochet chevron, I'm going to this transition into granny squares. So I'm going to do one round on a granny square for each day of the month and I'm going to lay it out just like I did my linen stitch square blanket. Since I'm using fingering weight yarn I do expect that the blanket is still going to be a manageable size but you won't be able to see that one until I start it in July. The entire concept of a temperature blanket is something I've been really attached to since I started them back in 2019. Temperature blankets are oddly a divisive topic within the maker community. Some people absolutely love them, some people hate them, some people don't know what they are and some people just don't care. There's been a lot of conversation over the month of December going into January about folks who are working on temperature blankets, how they're making it personal and how they're doing things a little bit differently. Now I want to address something really quick because one of the points that folks are making around temperature blankets is I don't care about the weather. Um, 
Honey, I don't know if you realize, but it's the year of our Lord 2023 and the weather is incredibly important. What I have found over the course of doing temperature blankets is it makes you hyper aware of the weather. The fact that it's 45 degrees in January here in Michigan is something that I am more aware of because I've been working on temperature blankets for the last four years. Is there much I can do about it? Obviously not really, but it is something that is always top of mind for me. I'm not about to get into any weird politics or anything, but there is often a cross section between politics and craft. So I recognize that I lean into it and the best thing I can do is make a gorgeous blanket out of it When it comes down to it I love doing a temperature blanket because it's something fun I can work on throughout the year It's that project that tethers me gives me some grounding something that I can look forward to and really be excited about and this year Since I'm working on two blankets instead of one I'll have constant motivation for this first blanket so I can get to my second one now If you're planning to make a temperature blanket this year I would absolutely love to see it if you're on Instagram use hashtag temp blanket 2023 that's the hashtag that I'll be using and following throughout the year. I would love to see your progress and hopefully in a future podcast episode I can show you what mine looks like. Now at the point that I'm recording this we are barely a week into January so my temperature blanket is literally the only thing I've finished so far but if you are curious about other projects that I recently finished you can check out my 2022 year in review video. I'll link it right here. Now let's transition into recent acquisitions. So those are things that I've recently incorporated into my craft life. The first of those being my 2022 Advents. Now every year hand dyers as well as big box yarn companies create advents. You typically start somewhere around December 1st and you're opening a new mini skein of yarn leading all the way up to Christmas. I treated myself to the Hue Loco advent and I was also gifted the Hedgehog Fibers advent and I opened those up every single day in my stories over on Instagram. I then strung them up on my wall so I was able to look at them from my desk every single day. They're actually right here behind the camera. I will give you a sneak peek at those. I mean both palettes are absolutely beautiful. First, let's talk Hue Loco. So Nicole and her team over there worked up this really fantastic fade. It starts on the lighter side with some soft blues and pinks. You get a lot of the base of the yarn coming through so you get those really nice creamy notes. And then eventually it transitions into more saturated colors. So some more pinks, peachy tones. Eventually you get into this very saturated deep, a little bit darker colors of the palette. Lots of blues, greens, you're getting some speckles, tonals, as well as variegated shades. And then the palette ends with some pretty blues and purples. So since we have this gorgeous fade on our hands, I need to be super intentional about how I use this yarn. Because one, I wanna make sure I honor the hard work that they put into creating this absolutely perfect fade. And two, I wanna use all of the yarn in one project. So I'm thinking it'll eventually become a shawl, but I have to decide what shawl that's gonna be. I'm considering one of those shawls that's kind of that unnatural triangle shape. So I'll need to dig deep into my Ravelry library and see if there are any good crochet patterns that I can try out. Now onto Hedgehog Fibers. Now that one is just a hodgepodge of color. I absolutely adore Hedgehog because it's always unexpected, but somehow when you see it, you know it. They have created this signature dye style with all of these pops of speckles, and I just can't get enough of them. So every single day that I opened up the advent, while the colors don't fade necessarily, they all somehow seem to go together. You've got these bright pinks, these acid greens, these really vibrant yellows. You really do get a little bit of everything. And I love that the folks at Hedgehog aren't scared of color. The combinations that they've created are really out of this world. And I'm sure whatever this goes into is gonna be one of the wackiest things in my closet. My brain is telling me that this needs to become a sweater, but I don't know if it's gonna be crocheted or knitted. That is gonna be the part that's really exciting. So I will keep you posted on that project whenever I do start it. The thing with my advents though, is I never open them with the intention of working on a project immediately. It's very possible that you won't see anything created from my advents for a year or two. And I'm totally fine with that. I think for a while I was really obsessed with anything that comes into my studio, I need to make something with it immediately. And that's just not really sustainable. I always have works in progress going on and I'm always kind of cycling things in and out of my craft space. So I've had to become okay with letting things sit in my stash for a while, but also managing my stash and keeping it at a level that I'm comfortable with. So my advents are gonna stay on their string. I'm probably gonna take them off the wall and put them in my mini skein drawer, but I'm not too pressed about using 
them anytime soon. But once I do finally break those out, believe me, you'll be one of the first people to know. And while it's not a brand new acquisition to my stash, I did want to mention these dots hook from We Crochet again. I've shown you these in a couple videos, but they have been sold out pretty much since they first came in stock back in December. Well, I am excited to share that these are coming back in stock. So Monday, January 9th, you'll be able to find the dots hooks back on the We Crochet website. Not only are they coming back, but they're going to be on sale for a short amount of time. These sold out within hours of the first day, and I expect that that second we stock is going to sell out again. So what we've got going on here are long metal tips that go into a nice rubberized handle, and then down here is just a hard plastic. You're getting nine usable sizes at a really reasonable price, and these are going to be great for lots of different situations. If you need travel hooks, go for dots. If you're trying to teach somebody to crochet and maybe want to create a nice gift basket for them, add a pack of the dots hooks. You can find a link to these down in the description and make sure you pick them up on the 9th because I can't guarantee that they're going to be available after that. I am currently using my dots hooks for my gumball sweater and it is helping me breeze through it. The cotton on that metal slides with the perfect tension. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know that I constantly preach how important it is to invest in your tools. And investing in your tools doesn't have to break the bank. And I I think the folks at We Crochet have proved that. Those dots hooks are really reasonably priced, but they have a lot going for them. Last but not least for recent acquisitions is the Cozy in Colorado collection from Q Loco. It's the black box of joy. Mm pure, pure joy. Hue Loco puts out multiple collections throughout the year. I appreciate how each collection has a different vibe. It has a different kind of core set of colors. And the Cozy in Colorado collection is no exception. The entire vibe behind this collection is being super cozy inside the house because it is too treacherous to go outside. So Nicole and the team have put together 10 different colors to evoke that vibe, that really cozy, relaxed, settled down, middle of winter vibe. There are 10 different colors in here and I would love to show them to y'all. So first we have our warmer colors. So these are called Favorite Flannel, which I am 99% sure is going to be the fan favorite of this collection. It's beautiful with these blues, greens, dusty purples. It's got some grays in here. This is the kind of color that looks perfect on everyone. Like, look. I think this would work well for just about any skin tone. So if you've got shawls or sweater patterns that you've had in mind and you need a really good variegated color for them, Favorite Flannel is gonna be your go-to. There are also some tonals in here. This one is called Fireside. It's a good caramel brown. This one is called Mystic Mountain, which is a nice bright royal blue. My personal favorite is this one is called Toasty Toes. It's got some nice soft dusty pinks, some really gorgeous speckles happening in there. This is the kind of color that I constantly reach for. You'll find something like this within my stash at all all time. I'm pretty sure this is the first thing I grabbed out of the boxes. I'm like, ooh, bye. And then we also have Retreat, which has these really pretty combinations of browns and pinks in here. Down on the second layer, we have some cooler colors. So this one here is called First Snow. In addition, we have Alpine, which is this nice classic winter green. And then we have what I think is Alpine's perfect complement, which is called Comfort, which has kind of some minty greens in there. And then we have well Welcome Home, which is this really soft cream color that is mostly just speckles. Like, let me move this label out the way. And you're going to find like some soft grays that have been added to the base, but also these really nice shocks of speckle. And last but not least, we have Nippy Nose, which I love because it does kind of remind you of icicles and cold, which is not something I typically reach for, but I think this is just such a darling and adorable color. So the Cozy in Colorado collection is currently live. You can find all the details over on Hugh Loco's website. She has multiple bases, different fibers, different weights. The only base that you won't find Cozy in Colorado on is the tweed base, which you don't really need tweed for these because these colors really stand up on their own. If you take a look at Nicole's Instagram, she also did a live debuting all of these colors, talking about color combinations and project ideas. And you can also find different color combinations on her Instagram itself. There are also mini skein sets and sock sets. So make sure you check out the Cozy in Colorado collection. Now I do want to make you aware that I have a project planned for some of these skeins. Let me show you my palette. So I decided to pull five different shades from the Cozy in Colorado collection. And I'm going to be making a very simple Tunisian crochet shawl. So the colors I pulled are 
Toasty Toes, Fireside, Mystic Mountain, Alpine, and Favorite Flannel. So this project is going to come to life over the course of late January through February, and the plan is to release it in late February. Now here's the deal. Cozy in Colorado is only open for one week. So if you're interested in making the eventual project that I create, you'll want to get one skein in DK of each of these five colors. And then hopefully by the time the yarn arrives to you, the pattern will be out and you can make it as well. I've had the idea for what I'm going to do with these skeins for quite a long time and I think I've just been waiting for the perfect yarn to come along and I'm pretty sure this is it. I love the tones going on here. It does have this really good cozy vibe to it. So I'm really excited to get started once I clear out some of these other whips. So keep an eye out for that pattern, but make sure you check out Cozy in Colorado, which again is available right now. A link to it is down in the description. Now we're going to transition into what's going on, and there's actually a lot happening here in Teal Yarn Crafts land. First of which being my upcoming keynote address at Midwest Craft Con. The Midwest Craft Convention, aka Midwest Craft Con, is a craft-related convention that is put on by the folks behind Craft and Outlaws out in Columbus, Ohio. The Midwest Craft Convention aims to educate and inspire handmade business owners to not only grow their business but really fall in love with their business. And what I appreciate about this convention is it doesn't matter what type of crafty entrepreneur you are. Whether you're a blogger or a YouTuber, an author, or if you create physical or even digital product, there's going to be something at this convention for you. Not only do they have discussions and the keynote, but they also have fun workshops so you can try out some different crafts as part of that event. Now I am incredibly grateful to be the keynote address and I'm currently writing my keynote speech. I have over an hour to talk about what I think is most important to creative entrepreneurs and I'm keeping the full topic of my address a secret right now. There are not nearly enough events like this that welcome creative entrepreneurs at whatever level of their business they're at to soak in so much wisdom and information. Not only do you get to go to the keynote addresses or some of the lectures and workshops but you also get to do some networking and make new crafty friends. I have found folks that have helped tremendously with NTO Yarn Crafts just from going to Midwest Craft. I've always believed that when you pull that many creative and crafty people together, nothing but positivity can come from it. And the folks behind Midwest CraftCon work very hard to make sure the entire weekend is valuable. You can find out more information about Midwest CraftCon and purchase your ticket from their website. And also, if you're going to be in Columbus for a few days, take a look at the other things that are happening within the city. I lived in Columbus for 12 years. 12 years? I lived in Columbus for 12 years and don't think I got to everything that city has to offer. So definitely check it out and come see me. Another fun thing that's going on is I recently collaborated with the Crafters Box once again. If you're not familiar already, the Crafters Box commissions amazingly talented artists to create visual workshops and then builds craft kits to send to you so you can make those projects in your very own home. I worked with the Crafters Box once before to make a Tunisian crochet shawl, which I absolutely adored, and they tapped me again for another crochet project. This time we did these boho granny square bags, and y'all already know how I feel about granny squares, so I was so excited to work on this project. The bags come together beautifully. You lay them out in this grid, fold them up and seam them, and somehow this disparate collection of granny squares becomes this gorgeous bag. The folks at the Crafters Box commissioned a local artist to make these really nice leather handles as well, and the yarn itself comes from Italy, and it feels amazing. The color palettes are fantastic. You can go with a colorful bag or a cream bag, and you can also upgrade to a colorful blanket or a cream blanket. The video workshop walks you through all of the materials as well as creating your granny squares, seaming your projects together, and giving them that finishing touch. I am obsessed with the Crafters Box for a lot of different reasons. The main reason being that they really do honor, value, and promote great artists. And I'm not saying great artists because they're popular or well-known. I'm talking about artists who have great talent. They harness that talent, allowing the artists to be their best selves in front of that camera, to teach an art that they love and are passionate about, and share it with folks who want a piece of that passion. The result is a wonderful, usable piece of art that you might not have made otherwise. If you're also in a year of discovery, check out the Crafters Box and get my workshop, which I have linked down in the description. And from there, you can explore other past workshops, or you can sign up for a subscription description and be ready for the upcoming workshops that they have planned for the year. Now when I went out to San Diego to record with the Crafters Box, I was in a house with one other artist who is amazingly talented. I don't want to spill the beans, but I know her workshop is coming up very soon and I am looking forward to that one. And last but not least in this segment, I wanted to announce the official start of Make It Cal 2023, which kicks off on Monday, January 23rd. The Make It Crochet Along is a crochet along I started several years ago to help us transition out of the haze and funk of 
the holidays. We have spent weeks, if not months, making gifts for other people, and it's about dang time we made something for ourselves. For Make It Cow 2023, you will pick any TL Yarncrafts pattern, free or paid, and make it over the five weeks of the crochet along. You'll then share that project on Instagram using hashtag Make It Cow 2023, and I'll be sharing plenty of those throughout the five week crochet along within my Instagram stories. And it wouldn't be a TL Yarncrafts crochet along without some really good giveaways. There will be a new giveaway partner every single week, and I have to say the lineup for 2023 is pretty sweet. So if you need some inspiration for your Make It Cow project, here are some ideas. To start, I made the Crochet Along Starter Pack. These are eight patterns that I put into a low cost bundle, and you can make any of these patterns within those five weeks. Included in that bundle is the project that I'm wearing right here. This is the flat iron shawl, which is one of the first shawl patterns I ever created. I love this one because it uses three coordinating skeins of fingering weight yarn to make this large triangle shawl. This is a great chance to use up some of those beautiful skeins that you've been hoarding in your closet or to pick up something new from a hand dyer that you've never tried before. In addition to the flat iron shawl, the crochet along starter pack includes the Westmont shawl, the French press cardi, the Kima cardi, the amber afghan, the fireside basket, as well as the Harper bucket bag and the Barclay beanie. So that's eight patterns that you could easily finish up within the five week time frame. If you want to make creating your project even easier, try out one of my kits that I've created in collaboration with Lion Brand. Those kits include a PDF copy of the pattern as well as all of the yarn that you need to create it as well as optional tools and notions. Lion Brand is constantly running sales so make sure you're signed up for their newsletter so you can get those coupon codes and get your Make It Cow project kit for a steal. And Make It Cow 2023 starts off on January 23rd. There will be a live cast on party on my Instagram so tune in for that so we can start our projects together. Find full details of the Make It Crochet Along on my blog and I'm so excited to crochet along with you. I always look forward to Make It Cow every single year because it's a chance for me to really jumpstart my year. Start something new, start something fresh, and also rediscover some of my old patterns. If there is a TL Yarn Crafts project that you've been a little bit nervous to try or something that is going to stretch you outside of your comfort zone, I strongly encourage you to go for that pattern. But also if you need something that's a little bit more relaxing, something that's a bit more chill, I've got those patterns too. You can't go wrong with the TL Yarn Crafts pattern and you can't go wrong when you make something just for yourself. So join in to Make It Cal. It is completely free to participate. Just share that hashtag on Instagram and you can post your projects within the TLYC Makers Facebook group. I can't wait to see you there. And now it's time for the moment we've all been waiting for our 500k celebration. I have to give a huge thank you to you watching this who subscribed to my channel and got us to this massive milestone. This is just a reminder to me that what I'm creating here on my channel is valuable to other people. Sometimes you're not really sure and we think we're just talking to a void because I'm literally sitting in my room speaking to a camera with no one behind it. But that number 500k reminds me that there is someone behind this camera. Someone who is watching, working on their project, cuddling their pet and drinking something warm just like I do. YouTube has become kind of my primary source for media. I love discovering new channels, trying different projects, and just listening to the perspectives of other people. So I'm grateful that you spent a bit of your YouTube time with me and I hope it continues to be a benefit to your craft life. So to kick off this celebration, I'm going to start by answering some questions. I asked my friends on YouTube and Instagram to send in questions. So I'm gonna pick a few from each, starting with Instagram. When I put the call out for these questions, I said, skip the softball questions. Y'all don't need to know when I started crocheting or what got me into the craft. We've talked about that a million times. I wanted things to get a little bit more risque, a little bit more exciting. I wanted to dive deep. So I'm really excited to see the questions that y'all came up with and uh, how personal y'all really got. Woo, it's a bunch of them. Okay, here we go. So this question comes from Iceland and she says, do you ever use Etsy? I never really see you talk about the platform. Here we go. Here we flip and go. So I started out on Etsy. Etsy was my main selling platform. I did not have my own site. I was selling digital patterns as well as finished goods on Etsy. Etsy was experiencing its heyday when I joined back in 2016. It was still a small private company and they really focused on elevating and promoting their artists. Slowly over time, the website started to look better. They organized the shops better. They started adding the about sections and the frequently asked questions sections. They made it a lot easier to search and they made it very clear to artists how to show up in search. So I had a lot of benefit being on Etsy in those early days and I had a ton of sales. But eventually, like a lot of these companies, Etsy went public and took the power out of the hands of artists and put it in the hands of shareholders. That's about the time that Etsy's fees started going up, that you started seeing a lot of shops on Etsy that were 
were not from handmade sellers, that were from businesses overseas that were selling mass-produced garbage, just like you see on lots of other marketplace sites. Etsy slowly started going downhill, and the straw that broke the camel's back for me is when they started charging a fee for items that didn't even sell. The fact that I had a listing in my shop for a certain amount of time that didn't sell, they had a fee for that. And I was just thinking to myself, why? Why are you penalizing me for my shop not selling as well as I hoped it would? How does it hurt you having a digital listing on your site that's not moving? And I just got fed up with it and I threw my hands up and I was like, you know, this is the problem with not owning your own presence online. By not having my own website, I was at the whim of Etsy and the fact that they kept going in these wrong directions just was an indication to me that there wasn't a good fit for me anymore. Now I know a lot of people are on Etsy and have a really great relationship with that company, but it just wasn't a good fit for me and I don't think the current state of Etsy really honors and promotes their artists. So anyone who's considering going into business for themselves, while Etsy is a really great place to start, that shouldn't be your end all be all. I always encourage folks to have their own website and sell their products there. So no, I don't talk about Etsy much because I'm not a fan. <laughs> And there's that. What else y'all got? So this one comes from my friend ARV Crochet. Hey girl, how you doing? So she asks, what is your most slept on pattern? And honey, the list goes on and on and on. But one of my most slept on patterns, I believe, is my cadenza wrap. Now this is a pattern that I created in collaboration with a new yarn called Camp Color. Now the colors that they gave me aren't typically the colors that I go for. There's red, there's yellow, black in there. And those kind of primary colors aren't typical teal yarn craft colors. And I think that kind of contributes to why this pattern wasn't really well received but for better or worse camp color is going under now the silver lining here is that I get to remake the cadenza wrap in more teal yarn crafts favorable colors also this is going to be a really great stash busting opportunity because I can either make this with mini skeins full skeins literally whatever I have in my closet it is a bit frustrating to me that the cadenza wrap is slept on because aside from the actual colors that are used which I know really does affect one's interest in a pattern the pattern itself is really fantastic looking at it now the Cadenza Wrap is one that can use a refresh and maybe that'll become my Make It Cow 2023 project. So thanks for the idea. So this is a really great question. This is from Hylian Hero and it says, any tips for saying yes to enough projects without over committing or burning out? Now that is something that I know is very difficult because as creatives, we are always excited and looking forward to new projects. But there always comes a point within a project where you kind of hit that wall where it's not really as fun anymore and it kind of becomes worse. I think it's important for us all to know and recognize that point within ourselves and have the motivation to push past it. Because if you're going to start something, especially within your business, within your creative business, you have to have the wherewithal to finish it. Now, one of the best ways that I can think of to committing to the right amount of projects is having some kind of project management within your business. For me, that project management looks like an actual calendar where I write down the start and potential finish dates for the projects that I'm working on. I have to be really strategic about the projects that I take on over the course of the year because I want to honor whatever partnerships that I sign up for but I also need to honor my need for rest or my need for relaxation my need for play when it comes to my crafting so if you are the kind of person who wants to take on more projects whether it's for your personal crafty life or your professional crafty life having some kind of calendar of when you're going to commit to those projects is going to be important so it does take some planning it takes some intention and saying yes to projects means that you're going to have to say no to some others and being prepared to do that typically the projects that I have to say yes or no to include some kind of partner so I have to know how to let someone down easy to say no I don't have space in my project plan right now but maybe we could talk about some different type of project so let's pull a couple more from Instagram I found one from Mika Firefly this is a really good one she says what do you feel are the challenges POC designers face so that's people of color designers face and what could be done about it so I don't claim to be the expert on what makes this craft life this influencer life more or less difficult for people of color but I do recognize that we typically have to work harder than our non POC counterparts to get a foothold in this industry but I do think we have to take some accountability on why sometimes that journey is a little bit harder so while I can't change any of the systemic issues that we have in getting a foothold in this industry I do think there are some things that we can do to give ourselves a leg up one of the issues that I see a lot with makers influencers content creators that look like me 
is that we do not invest in our equipment. One of the easiest ways to get somebody to turn off your video is having bad audio, bad visuals, bad lighting, no consideration to your backdrop. Like these are simple tweaks that we can make just to upgrade and promote the look of the content that we create. So once you start making a little bit of money, get a better camera, get a better mic, invest in your background a little bit. I'm sure there are content creators that you watch and you're like, wow, I really love how they do that. Take those pointers and try your best to incorporate them into your own life. And this doesn't have to be stuff that's super expensive. I've seen backgrounds that are literally fluffy fabric from Joanne with some twinkle lights over it. And that looks super duper cute. In addition, I see makers of color that have difficulty taking the first step when it comes to partnering with some of your favorite brands. When I was first interested in working with Lion Brand and I was using Woolies Thick and Quick for everything in my craft show booth, I tagged Lion Brand in every single photo. And that was long before I emailed them asking for product. I wanted to get on their radar early. So when I finally did make an ask for partnership, I had already done that warm introduction. I had proven that I was producing strong product with consistency and those are good characteristics of a future partner. So think about how you present online and how a future brand partner is going to align with your values in your production. And last but not least, I think us makers of color are missing a very huge opportunity to partner with each other. We don't need anyone to validate the work that we do, the talent that we bring to the table. So if you see another maker of color, are you promoting them? Are you lifting them up? Regardless of how high your star has already risen. Think of the concept of a rising tide lifts all boats. We can do that for ourselves. We don't need anyone to validate or reassure us. So find opportunities to partner with other makers. I think sometimes we get really nervous like, oh, I don't have enough followers. I couldn't possibly do this. I don't have enough subscribers. I couldn't possibly do this. Those are vanity metrics that have nothing to do with your talent. All of these platforms are run off of algorithms. And many of those algorithms are designed to work against us. So find ways to break through for yourself and for your fellow makers of color. All right, one more from Instagram, only because I came across this and I'm like, I've been looking for a reason to talk about this. So this one comes from Vegas Holder. And their question is, what part of your business gets you the most money? Now talking about money within handmade business for some reason is very taboo, but I am more than happy to share with you the platforms that make me the most money within TO Yarn Crafts. The first of which being YouTube. I started my channel back in 2017 and though I haven't always been consistent, I have always tried to create consistently strong content. When I don't have the idea for a really strong video, I just won't post one. There's this false idea running around YouTube that consistency is more important than quality and that's just not true. So YouTube is my biggest money maker because the videos that I do produce are of a higher quality and of interest of people within my niche. So that is my number one money maker here within TO Yarn Crafts. My second money maker is going to be my blog. I monetize my blog from the day that I started and I have transitioned through different monetization companies over time. I started with Google AdSense which with respect pays you in pennies but it is one of the easiest ways to monetize when you don't have a strong following yet. From there I transitioned to Mediavine which is kind of a mid-grade advertiser. Once you get enough page views you can then transition up to AdThrive which is the company that I work with right now. The RPMs are the highest in the game as far as I know and the ads that they put on your site are a lot more seamless and you get a lot more options. What's nice about that though is since I'm able to create ad revenue from my blog it really encourages me to put more free content content there. Whether that's patterns, tips, tutorials, interviews, product reviews, all the things that you want to see from TO Yarn Crafts, I can easily put on my blog because that revenue is automatic. And then the third highest producer of income within my business is my website, toyarncrafts.com. That's where I sell my digital patterns as well as my merch. Now my website is set to surpass my blog revenue in 2023 and that was an intentional choice that I've created. But it is interesting for me to see that my shop, the actual website that I've created to generate income, is my third highest income generator within my business. YouTube and my blog are my highest income generators, but those are two sites where I'm very rarely actually selling anything. My biggest takeaway there is there is an opportunity for you to offer all of that talent and information basically for free and still create a very sizable income. So I hope I answered that really great question and I really hope we have an opportunity to talk more about kind of the nuts and bolts of running a handmade business. Now let's move into the questions that came from you, my YouTube family. All right, so this is a good one. Y'all, y'all did not disappoint on the questions. Okay. This one comes from Cadian 
Adair, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm really sorry. But the question is, what was the hardest criticism that was thrown at you? And early in my career, I was told by someone I very much admire in this maker community that my patterns were too simple, that they were too basic and nobody would be interested in them because I'm not teaching anything new, I'm not doing anything innovative. And that really hurt my feelings, not only by what they said, but who they were. I think we all underestimate the impact that we have on each other, that the words that come out of our mouths not only go into one's ears but also into our hearts. So when we harshly criticize each other, that's not just a statement that you threw away. That's a statement that's going to sit with somebody for a long time. And someone saying that my patterns were too basic and that nobody would like them very early in my career almost made T.O. Yarncraft not a thing. But thankfully I know myself well. I knew what I was getting at. I know what I was trying to accomplish even with those simpler patterns. I was trying to attract people who have difficulty right at the beginning of learning this craft. Not being good at something, having a hard time learning something can be super discouraging and when you're just picking up crochet for the first time you're not sure how it's going to go and you have a lot of trouble because the pattern is too difficult it's too intricate or it's hard to read that can make you be like well I guess crochet isn't for me and I wanted to avoid as many people as possible having that experience and aside from wanting to encourage beginner crocheters simpler patterns are what I'm really into you see I keep going back to these linen stitch squares I do linen stitch granny stitch all the time. Why? Not because they're simple and easy, but because they're the projects that I gravitate towards. I use crochet as my relaxing activity, so I rarely go for something that's way too intricate or difficult. I love learning new things, so I'll swatch out a new stitch or play around with a different concept, but I always go back to my comfort stitches and my comfort projects. And I know there are other people out there like me that like to use their craft time as a time to unwind and relax, and it's not always about a new learning experience. So that was some kind of iffy criticism that I received early on, but I didn't let it deter me. I mean, obviously we're still here. Okay, this is a really great question. So I think this is Eve's affection. And the question is, breaking the fourth wall, how do you feel about the parasocial relationship inherent in being an online content creator? I've listened to your voice for so many hours, it feels so familiar to me. You have hundreds of thousands of fans you have never met before. How do you feel about that? I feel like my anxiety would go bananas. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to be really, really honest with you. The fact that I can sit in my guest bedroom and talk to a camera and connect with so many people is wild to me. There are hundreds of thousands of people out there who listen to my voice, who follow my tutorials and follow my recommendations for products that I've never met, likely never will meet. I read as many comments as I can, but there's a lot that I don't get to. I honestly think about that a lot. Even this idea of reaching 500k, I don't think I've really put my arms around that entire concept. I received some advice from a very popular content creator once, and the advice was, instead of feeling like you're speaking to your entire audience, speak to the camera like you're talking to your best friend. You want them to understand something. You want them to learn something. You want them to relate to something because eventually everyone on the other side of that screen will become your best friend because that's how you're talking to them. And that's how I keep my anxiety low. That's how I keep the nervousness of making mistakes here low because I make mistakes and say silly things in front of my best friend all the time. And she doesn't judge me. She doesn't look at me sideways. And I attempt to create spaces within my content where there is no judgment. There is no side eye. There is no what the heck is she talking about? So yes, the concept of reaching out to hundreds of thousands of people is a bit nerve wracking, but we have to kind of distill this down into what it is. And it's trying to build a connection. It's trying to create that tether between individuals that is meaningful and encouraging and positive. That's my strategy. <laughs> <laughs> this was a really fun one. It's from Danielle Abrams and she said, please tell me more about your cats and how on earth do you keep the cat hair from overwhelming your whips? Okay, so we're gonna take the second part of this question first. Miss Danielle, the cat hair overwhelms my whips. I, I can't do anything about that. I invite my cats into all of my spaces, including my craft room. Thankfully, my cats are not interested in the yarn at all. If I'm using a ball of yarn and it's rolling around, they'll probably bat at it once and be like, mm, I'm over it. But as far as the actual cat hair, it's a thing. It's a problem and we deal with it with lint rollers and like cat hair picker upper things. But since I don't sell my finished pieces, I'm not as concerned about cat hair getting on everything. I don't make gifts a lot. Pretty much everything I make is for myself or just for photos. So it's not something that's really top of mind for me. But yes, I would love to tell you about my cats. So my first cat is named Mr. Peanut Butter. He was gifted to me by my husband on our very first Christmas. I remember that day very, very vividly. It was Christmas day and my husband came into the house and 
told me to go upstairs. So I went upstairs knowing that he was gonna bring in some kind of gift. I thought it was gonna be something for our house, maybe like a new TV or a piece of furniture. I came downstairs kind of looking at the walls, looking for this big gift. And then I looked on our coffee table and there was a cat carrier and a little cat inside. My heart melted in that moment. I hadn't even seen the cat, but all I knew was that there was a cat in that box and it was mine. So that was Mr. Peanut Butter. That's why I call him my eternal Christmas present. So Peanut is now 12 years old. He's getting on the older side. He's having a few health issues. We actually just transitioned him from dry food to wet food because he's having a little trouble chewing. But that transition did help a lot because he's got that spring back in his step. Since he was having trouble chewing, he wasn't eating very well. So I don't think he was getting his energy before, but now he is and he's my baby boy again. Now, a couple years after we got Peanut, my mom came to visit and she said, Said that at one point during the day while me and my husband were away at work peanut went down into the living room and just started yowling howling so sad and my mom was like oh he needs a friend and i was like mm, more cats bring it on so my husband and i went to the humane society on a friday after work we found this older female cat and we were going to take her home but it was too late in the day and we couldn't get the paperwork done we came back the next day and they had sold the cat already so we're like okay i guess we got to look for something else so my husband and i are going through all of the cats cat carriers and we came across this little black cat this little scrawny black kitten big old ears all black with these bright eyes we gave her a little pet on the head and we were about to move on to the next cage but when my husband bent down to pet the cat that was under this black cat the black cat stuck her paw out and like started clawing at my husband's hair like excuse me come back I'm up here so we're like all right we're gonna take her out and we're gonna go sit in that little room where you get to play with them with the little toys and everything so she couldn't be bigger than a minute but she was just into everything she loved all the toys she loved to play and she was just very bright and alert as kittens are. So we're like, oh yeah, we're attached. We'll take her home. So we take her home. We name her Sheba the Queen. Introduce her to Peanut. And Peanut's a little curious and she's a little, mm, but they got along well enough. Over the course of their lives, they're kind of indifferent to each other. Sheba has some issues with like close contact. Like she doesn't sit on laps. She loves to be petted, but she doesn't want to be on you. She just wants to be around you. And I think Peanut sometimes gets a little bit too cuddly for her liking. So she has to let him know when to back off. But she's my little baby girl she's 10 years old now and she loves naps and she loves pets and she's also transitioned to wet food which I think she's really enjoying so those are my babies I'm obsessed with them and they're now getting a little bit older so they both slow down but that's fine with me because most of my time is spent sitting on the couch watching tv anyway and they don't mind doing that with me so thanks for asking about my cats I really love talking about them all right, so we're gonna wrap up with this question. It's really good. This one is from Pride in Stitches. Starts it off with saying, okay, bestie. Okay, bestie, I love that. Pride in Stitches says, first off, I love your energy and the flow you give off like no tomorrow. I've been put through the ringer the past, let's be honest, decade or so, and I'm finally at the point in my life where I need to make a big move in the right direction. So my question is, how did you start your fiber arts business or is there any advice you could give to someone trying to start from scratch with nothing to their name? I hope you can shed some light on this, sending much love and positivity. I absolutely love this question because now that I've had some more time in the fiber arts community, I have some ideas on how maybe I would have started differently than I originally did. So I got my start in fiber arts in craft shows. Specifically, my very first craft show was in a church basement. I used my stash yarn and I made a zillion different things. There was no cohesion. There was no color palette. I barely had the things to set up my booth, but I did sell one thing. I always say that while I didn't make much monetarily, I took away a lot of experience from that opportunity specifically how to make my craft booth look better, how to move around my booth and really connect with my customers and how to draw people in. And those kinds of takeaways can be applied to any opportunity you have to make money within your creative business. So if you don't have a lot of financial resources to get started, you can look to other free ways to get eyes on your work and also move money within your business. So if you are somebody who is starting out with literally nothing and wants to make a go within fiber arts, here are some tips. One, make use of as many free platforms as possible. So that's going to be starting a YouTube channel, really getting serious about TikTok and Instagram, starting a free blog site. Thankfully, there are a lot more ways to get your name out there with very low monetary investment than even when I started my business. In addition to that, if you're low on resources, it's really important to niche down. Figure out where you want to start. Do you want to sell physical pieces? 
digital product? Do you want to sell in person or online? If you're not selling actual product, what is it that you are selling? If you're selling an idea, what does that look like on YouTube? What's your topic area? And how do you incorporate the production of your videos with what it is that you're trying to say? Are you the kind of person who wants to be the authority in your area? Or do you just want to be a friend who's imparting some information? Think about the perspective that you want to speak from and how you can generate income off of that. And my last piece of advice is that early on, confidence is way more valuable than your resources. When I walked into my Instagram feed, I walked in with authority, with confidence, my head held high, feeling like what I had to sell, what I had to say was the most important thing that you were going to see that day. I stood behind my product. I stood behind my ideas. And that's how I got brands and customers to agree with what I was trying to sell. You have to be your own cheerleader at every point in your business, particularly when your resources are low. You have to convince folks that you're worth what you're trying to sell. But that also means finding the balance between how much money you need to make and how much your product is actually worth. Coming out the gate selling patterns for $9 a piece probably not going to cut it. You haven't proven yourself. Make the effort to build the foundation and that takes time. I ran Teal Yarn Crafts as a side hustle for years before I went full time. I kicked this off in 2013 and I didn't quit my job till 2017. That's nearly five years of running a business just on nights and weekends to generate enough money for me to quit my job. And even when I did quit, I was still terrified. So if you're trying to break into the creative business, whether that's in fiber arts or somewhere else in craft, be really intentional about what it is that you're trying to create, walk in with all the confidence in the world and take the time to build the foundation. So I wish you all the best, honey. I hope this next decade is promising, encouraging, that there's abundance for you in whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Just take your time and understand that every journey starts with one step, one intentional step forward and keep moving. Alrighty, my loves, this feels like a great opportunity to transition into our 500K giveaway. And I'm gonna make this short and sweet. So to celebrate 500,000 followers here, I have decided to do a massive international giveaway. There is one main prize winner and you get all of this good merch right here. Now, since we met and surpassed our goal of 500K, I've decided to add five more winners to our giveaway. Each of those winners is gonna receive a digital copy of the Tunisian Crochet Handbook, as well as a $25 gift card to tlyarncrafts.com. So in total, there are six winners and all of these prizes are available internationally. So regardless of where you are, you can get in on this. And here's how you win. First, make sure you're subscribed to Teal Yarn Crafts here on YouTube. And second, comment down below why craft is so important to you. And when you comment, make sure you use the word crochet, C-R-O-C-H-E-T. The reason you need to include crochet in your comment is because the comment picker I use looks for specific words and the word that I'm picking for this giveaway is crochet. I'll pick a winner within the next couple days and I will announce right here on the channel so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Now when I announce the winner there will be a couple steps that you need to take to claim your prize so make sure you look for the giveaway announcement video here on the channel. I want to thank you so much for watching whether you just subscribed during our 500k push or you've been here from the very beginning or any time in between I want to thank you so much for spending a bit of your day with me. It really means the world to me because it is just so wild that we live in a time where we can communicate with each each other in this way. I look forward to reading every single one of your comments and I hope you are looking forward to a very crafty and exciting 2023. Thank you so much besties. I love you and I'll see you next time. Bye! <laughs>